had the privilege this past week uh, to participate in funeral service uh, for Anna's uh, sister, and uh, and I use John four, uh, John uh, seventeen, uh, where where Jesus says, "Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I, I go there to prepare a place for you." And I, and I shared with the people, there is great assurance in God's word. And, and, and especially in, in what Jesus said. I'll get to the sermon in just a moment. This is, just, this is extra this morning. Um, all because of what Justin was, was having a scene. Uh, I, I, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. And he was saying, don't let your heart be troubled about past sin. You know why? Uh, folks, in Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen? Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled for the present. And the reason for that is because God is right here with us. He, he, he's here in our midst today. Uh, he's with Pastor Cooper wherever he's at in another church today. Uh, he, he's at my kids' church down in Hemet. Uh, where can you go to get away from God? You can't go anywhere to get away from God. God is everywhere. He's, he's present. So don't let your heart be troubled. And then I said, don't let your heart be troubled for the future. Because Jesus Christ said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will be also. And that's eternity, beloved. Someday, this poor, lispering, stammering tongue is going to lie silent in the grave. Uh, you, you may feel like weeping, and that's fine. But folks, I want you to know that when this body that you see here today lies silent in the grave, Kenneth Reed is not there in the body. Kenneth Reed, the soul, is with God for all eternity. I'll be there with my Jesus. I will be there with my Heavenly Father. I'm going to be there with my daddy who went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. I'm, I'm going to be there with some of my, my dear preacher friends who have gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, Mary and I lost a child between our oldest daughter and our youngest son. And, 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 and folks, that child is with the Lord today. We're going we're gonna to meet him or her when we get to heaven, uh, even though we were not able to hold the child in our hand, uh, in our arms. Uh, what a joy it is to know that there's an eternity for those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. The Bible says that there are two places where people are going to spend eternity. One place is called hell, which is prepared for Satan, the devil, and his angels, and all those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, refuse to believe in him. And then the other place is called heaven, and heaven is for those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, who had been redeemed, who have had their sins forgiven, who have been given the privilege to call themselves a child of God. And what determines the place where you're going to spend eternity is the decisions you make in your life right now. If you receive Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you have an eternity in heaven. But if you refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> uh, you shall be cast into the lake of fire, the second death, hell. And so you need to make a decision. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to follow? Who's going to be the Lord and the master of your life? Folks, I have decided many, many years ago that Jesus is going to be my Savior and my Lord, and I asked him to come into my heart, and I have never regretted that decision, and I'm happy for it. And the closer I get to eternity, the happier I am. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I want you to take your Bibles and, buy, uh, and, and turn with me to, to uh, Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we'll be reading about 10 or 11 verses of Scripture there uh, as our text. And then, and then we're going to go back in, and, and, um, and point out two, two things that's, are, that's very important for us today. 
Chapter 3, book of Exodus, beginning with verse 1. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. By the way, isn't that interesting? Meanwhile, what does that refer to? It refers to everything else that happened before that in chapter 1 and chapter 2 that talks about the early years in the life of Moses. And so now he says here in chapter one, 3, verse 1, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. That is, God says, do not come closer. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, uh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord, that, and the word Lord there is the word Jehovah. That's a name for God. Then Jehovah said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors, and I know about their suffering. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land to good, to, to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the territory of the Canaanite, Hittites, Amorites, and all the other ites mentioned there. Then the Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses asked God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Sometimes God appears to individuals in different ways. Uh, do you remember Saul of Tarsus over there in the book of Acts? Uh, uh, Saul was persecuting people uh, who had become believers, uh, people of the way, those who were following the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and so uh, Saul uh, was going down to Damascus to pick up a group of people and bring them back to Jerusalem and, and to put them on trial and probably to, to uh, not only persecute them but, but even kill them. But what happened as Saul was on his way down to Damascus? There was a, a blinding light that knocked Saul to his, his knees and, and, and he heard a voice from the light that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, that, that voice, that, that person there in the midst of all that light was the Lord Jesus Christ. And you remember Saul was blind for about three days, you know, because of the brightness of, of that light. And by the way, folks, I really believe that that, uh, uh, that light uh, affected Saul's... Um, sight for the rest of his life. Uh, Paul, Paul really had a problem with, with sight. Uh, he, he said in one of his letters, uh, as he was writing to the church, he says, notice how large this letter is. And he's not talking about the length of the letter, he's talking about the size of its handwriting. I believe, folks, that, that Paul had a problem with his, his eyesight because of his experience with the Lord Jesus Christ that, that knocked him to his knees and humbled himself. Now, now, what happened with Saul? Saul became a believer. And his name was changed from Saul to Paul. And what did Paul do? 
He became the mighty missionary of the first century, folks. No one, no one was used by God any more in the first century than the Apostle Paul. Paul had a blinding light experience with the Lord. Here, in our passage of Scripture, we find that Moses is out there in the wilderness tending the sheep and he sees something that is very unique and, and strange. Uh, there was a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't consumed by the fire. And so Moses says, I, I think I will go nearer to this thing and see what is taking place. And all of a sudden, as, as Moses was approaching this bush, he heard God say, Moses, Moses, here I am. And God says, take off your sandals for the ground that you are standing on is holy ground. Now listen, Paul had that blinding light experience on the road to Damascus. Moses had this experience of, of God speaking as, as he was there in the burning bush. And the point that I want to make is that this is something that God does all the time. Uh, you may not have a burning bush experience, and you may not have a blinding light, and you may not be like Martin Luther, who was crawling up the steps on the Wittenberg Chapel there on his knees, praying for the rosary when God spoke to him, and the Reformation period started. My point is this, any old burning bush would do. Uh, what we need to experience today and what we need to understand today is not the kind of experience that we have with God, but we need to respond to God in a positive way and not in the way that Moses responded here in the third and fourth chapter. And that's what I want us to share uh, this morning. I want us to see two things from this passage of Scripture as we think about the underdogs of faith. How do you see Moses? What, what first comes to your mind when you think of Moses? Uh, the Ten Commandments? The lawgiver? Moses standing there and the Red Sea parting? We, we think about all of that. Folks, do you realize that was in the later years of Moses' life? Moses was not always that kind of man. Moses was like you and me. And we need to realize today that, that just like Moses, when we hear God speaking, we need to respond in a positive way and not a negative way. So there's two things I want us to see this morning. First of all, I want us to re uh, see, beloved, that when God calls someone to do a task, he always prepares them. And then secondly, I want us to realize that there is a, a, a crisis of beliefs when God says something to us that we need to adjust our life and do what God wants us to do and not what we want to do. Look, first of all, at God preparing individuals for the call that he has given to them. And to do that, we need to look at the years prior than this burning bush experience. By the way, how old was Moses when he died? Do any of you know? Huh? 120. Thank you, David. That's one point for David. Uh, he was 120 years of age. But do you know that you can look at the life of Moses and divide those 120 years into three segments of 40 years? The first 40 years was from the birth of Moses there in Egypt up until he was 40 years of age when he killed a soldier in Egypt. You remember the story? How many have seen Ten Commandments? You know, Cecil the Mill's Ten Commandments? They always show it, you know, at, at, at Easter time. I don't know why they show the Ten Commandments at Easter time. It has nothing to do with the resurrection of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. But I guess that's the only thing that, that uh, media could, could kind of emphasize as far as Christianity is concerned. You know, the, the story of, of Moses. And you know how Moses was born uh, in a Hebrew family. 
And, and, and the Hebrews were in captivity. They were slaves in Egypt for some 400 years. And, and, and the baby, male babies, were being murdered. They were being killed. And so Moses' mother put the, the baby Moses in a, in a little basket that was, uh, uh, had tar all on the outside so the water uh, there in the river would not uh, get into the basket. And, and the little baby was floating there in the river until some slaves of the daughter of, of um, Pharaoh saw the baby, brought the baby to Pharaoh's daughter. Remember the story? Uh, Moses' sister was uh, walking along the bank, you know, and keeping an eye uh, on that. And when the, when the slaves of the daughter of Pharaoh found the baby, uh, uh, Moses' sister says, you want me to go and get a, a Hebrew mother, a, a, a woman to care uh, for, for, for that child? And, and so Moses' mother became the nanny of her child. Moses. And he spent 40 years there in Egypt and finally at the age of 40 Moses saw the injustice that was going on there in Egypt and, and, and uh, was angry and, and, uh, and killed a soldier and then fearing that somebody had seen that and somebody is going to bring charges against him he fled the country of Egypt and went somewhere else. And so the first 40 years he was in Egypt. The second 40 years is out there in the wilderness tending the herds of his father-in-law, Jethro. And we don't hear too much about that. And we don't know much about that other than what's there in the second chapter of Exodus. But we know that he was out there for 40 years tending the, the flocks. And then all of a sudden, we come down here to the burning bush experience. It's at the end of that second 40 years. And God presents himself to Moses. And he says to Moses, I have heard the cries of my people there in Egypt. I have come down to deliver them. I am sending you to Egypt. Now you go and do what I tell you to do. And then what happened? Well, we'll get into that here in just a moment. Moses started to resign from that commission. I can't do that. I can't do that. And finally, after Moses makes adjustments in his life and in his beliefs, he goes down to Egypt, and then we have the last 40 years in the life of Moses, leading the Israelites out of the land of bondage over there to the brink of going into the promised land. So there's three 40-year segments. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, and then 40 years in the wilderness leading the people to the promised land. Now what I want us to focus on this morning, folks, is those first two 40-year segments. Because God prepared Moses during those two 40-year segments to do what he wanted him to do for the last 40 years of his life. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Look at what the scripture says. The scripture says in chapter 2 of Exodus 1 through 10 that Moses was born in a godly Hebrew home. Uh, even though he was discovered by the slaves of Pharaoh's daughter and he grew up in Pharaoh's home who, uh, who worked with Moses for those early formative years of his life when he was one, two, three, four, five, six years of age. It was his godly Hebrew mother. And what do you think she was teaching him? <laughs> she taught him about Jehovah God. She taught him about the father, uh, the, the, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Uh, he, <laughs> God prepared Moses by giving him the proper understanding of what a Hebrew is and who God is and who Abraham was and who Jacob was and who Isaac was. 
But not only did God prepare him there in Egypt for that, the scripture says in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, that Moses was reared and educated in Pharaoh's palace, in Pharaoh's home. What do you think the, the, the Pharaoh was teaching Moses? Talk to me. What do you think he taught Moses? Egyptian culture. Reading, writing, taught him about sciences. He taught him about government and leadership. And he taught him about military power and, and military might and, and, and all that you can do to, to protect the people. <laughs> Folks, I suggest to you that in those 40, year, 40 years in Egypt, God was preparing Moses for the last 40 years of his life. And then the scripture says, meanwhile, before uh, Moses went back to Egypt and, and took the people out of that land of bondage, he was out there in the wilderness as a shepherd tending the herds of his father-in-law Jethro. Now, we don't think too much about that. But I want to suggest to you, beloved, that during those 40 years, God was preparing Moses' heart. Uh, out there in the wilderness, and by the way, this is the same wilderness, folks, that he's going to lead the people through on his way to the promised land. For 40 years, he's out there tending the herds of his, his, his father Jethro. He was learning where all the oases were. He's learning about the best roads through the wilderness. He was learning about the climate. He was also learning how to take care of stupid, dumb animals. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? If you look at the Word of God, how many great Men of God were shepherds. <laughs> Moses was a shepherd for 40, out, 40 years out there in the wilderness, tending his father-in-law's sheep. What was King David before he became the king of Israel? A shepherd boy. <laughs> what are pastors? Shepherds. Under shepherds. Uh, folks, it's amazing how God uses shepherds to accomplish his will. Because when you shepherd, you, you, you learn an awful lot. And so I suggest to you, beloved, that in the 40 years that Moses was there in Egypt, he was being prepared by God for the task of leading the people. During the 40 years out there in the wilderness, he was being prepared by God in the university of the backside of the desert to do what God wanted him to do. Now, here's what you and I need to hear. God always prepares those that he calls. And so it is with you and me. God calls us to do the work that he wants us to do. What is the task of the Christian today? What's our responsibility? What does God want us to do? Folks, God wants us to share the good news. Jesus said to his disciples there in the book of Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 19 and 20, go and make disciples of all nations. Now listen, the emphasis is not upon going. Jesus was not saying you're going to have to go to South America. You're going to have to go to the darkest part of the Congo. He's not saying you have to go to Russia. Uh, really, when Jesus says, go ye therefore, the emphasis is as you go, make disciples. As you go to school, make disciples. As you go to work, make disciples. As you go to play, make disciples. As you go to church, make disciples. Folks, you and I are called by God to do the work that Jesus was sent to do. Christ Jesus came and died upon the cross of Calvary for the sins of mankind, and it's our responsibility as Christians to proclaim the good news. <sighs> but we're just like Moses sometimes. And we fail to remember that God prepares people that he calls to do the work 
that he calls us to do. Now look at Moses here in the second part of what I want to share today. And that is the excuses that Moses gives for not doing what God has called him to do. Look at the, 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 the third chapter again. And the scripture says, I have heard the cries of my people. And I have come down and I want you to go to Pharaoh to lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And what does Moses say? Well, first of all, he says in verse 11, Who am I? <laughs> Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Folks, I suggest to you that Moses started to resign from that which God wanted him to do by first pleading his own insignificance. I'm nobody. I've heard that by, by Christians today. Throughout the years, I have, I've heard people say, well, who am I? I, I? I'm not really anybody. Folks, if I had $100 for every time I heard someone say, well, I haven't been to Bible school. I haven't been to, to, a, to a Bible college. I, I haven't been to seminary. So, so I, I, I just can't go out and talk about Jesus. Hogwash. <laughs> Scripture says, Always be ready to give the reason for the joy that's in your heart. When, when, when someone says to you, boy, you're, 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 you're a nut, Ken, I say, hallelujah. I might be a nut, but I'm screwed to the right boat. Last week, uh, Pastor Cooper uh, preached on uh, 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 his message about King Josiah, remember? And, and, and you remember the story about Josiah being uh, a young king. Uh, his father was an evil king, and, and his grandfather was also an evil king. But during the reign of Josiah, they discovered the book of the law. And what did Josiah do when he read the book of the law? Whoa! He had remorse in his heart. Now, I asked somebody, well, in fact, I asked three people last week, did Pastor Cooper emphasize this? And they said no, and so I had to talk to Pastor Cooper about it. When the law was being read to the people, what did they do? They stood all day long and kept their mouth shut. I saw a video the other day on uh, faithit.com about a group of Chinese college students that were given their own personal copy of God's Word. Tears flow down their cheek. Oh, they said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I wonder, how many times has it been since we have hugged the Bible? Hold it dear to our heart. You see, Moses gave the excuse of being insignificant. And sometimes, beloved, we say, well, I'm nobody. Pastor, I can't talk to anyone about Jesus. I haven't been to college, Bible college. I haven't been to seminary. I haven't read the Bible all the way through. Folks, you and I need to realize that we're just like Moses sometimes, resigning from that which he calls us to do. Secondly, there in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, uh, Moses said to God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? What should I tell them? There, there's, a, there's a resonation of ignorance. Moses, I, I, I really don't know who you are. 
And, and when they ask me, why, why should we follow you? Uh, what am I going to say? And, and, and God came back and says, I am the father of, uh, of Abraham and the father of Isaac and the father of Jacob. Uh, Moses was taught that back there in Egypt. God prepared his heart back there in Egypt with the very basic things that his mother taught him about who God is. And sometimes, folks, I think even in our world today, we have a tendency to claim ignorance. Don't know who God is. <laughs> God is the creator of the universe. He's everywhere. <laughs> where, where can you go to get away from God? If you go to the mountains, God is there. You go to the valleys, God is there. Folks, you can't get away from God. I'm excited about the upcoming debate between uh, the science guy, what's his name? Huh? Nye, Bill Nye, and, and, and Ken Ham, uh, uh, a creationist, uh, answers in Genesis. He's an Australian guy. And, uh, and I'm excited about the upcoming thing. And there's a, amazing how many atheist people are trying to tell Nye, you don't need to be debating him. Uh, it's below who you are. Uh, you, know, you, you, don't, need to, you know, don't need to do that. I think Nye is running scared, folks. Because I believe personally that it is harder to prove that there is no God than to prove that there is a God. I'm not a smart man, but I'm not a dummy either. And I look at the very creation, the, the very universe, the, the animals, the, uh, the, the, the birds, the, the insects, and, and I see all of this unique. And folks, I cannot believe that all of this happened by chance. I do not believe that nothing plus nothing times nothing equals everything. <laughs> I believe that when the Bible says in the beginning God created, he did exactly what the Bible said that he did. Moses says, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm ignorant of who you are. And a lot of times, folks, we as Christians act as though we are ignorant of God. Do you know how the best way to get to know who God is? This book right here. This book right here. Have we studied the Word of God? Have we applied the Word? I think Pastor Cooper made that point last week. Folks, it's not enough to say, I have read through the book of God. What's important is to apply the Word of God to our lives. Have we applied the word of God to our life? Here's my life, folks. Here, here, here's my life. And, and, and I can think about the word of God, and, and I can meditate upon the word of God, and I can remember the word of God, and, 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 uh, and, and recite the word of God. But folks, that really doesn't matter until I get the word of God down into my life. Amen? Amen? James says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Now, I can have the word of God out here on the outskirts of my life. And somebody comes along, pull it, take it. And, and, and they pull it out of my hand. No matter who we are, pull it. Can't hold it. Now, <laughs> now I get the word of God down in my life. Be doers of the word. I've got it down deep in my life. And somebody comes along and tries to take it away. And that's my left hand, and it's the weakest hand. <laughs> the best way to know God is to study his word of God and apply it to our life. Third excuse that, that <laughs> Moses gives there is... is, is Oh, God, this is neat. Uh, he says, um, they won't listen to me. I, I go down there, they won't listen to me. 
And do you remember what God says to Moses at this time? Uh, what's that in your hand? And what did Moses have in his hand? He's a shepherd. A staff. And, 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 and God says, throw it down on the ground. And what did that piece of wood become? A snake. <laughs> I don't like snakes. And then he says to Moses, pick that snake up by the tail. And he picked it up and what did it become? A staff. And then God said, Moses, put your hand in your, in, in your cloak. Put your hand inside of your clothing and pull it out. And when he pulled it out, what happened to his hand? Leprosy was on his hand. He said, put it back in your cloak. He did. He said, pull it out. And he pulled it out. And what ha- his hand was healed. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. Here Moses is standing before, the, before a burning bush that is not consumed. A, a, a wooden staff is made into a snake and then made back into a staff. And he puts his hand in his clothing and pulls it out and there's leprosy all over. He puts it back in, pulls it out, and the leprosy is gone. Let me tell you, I think I would fall upon my knees. God was saying to Moses, I'm with you. I will show them who I am. And you know the rest of the story, and you know about the plagues of Egypt and all of that. And yet, Moses gave another excuse. What did he say? A, 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 I, 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 I'm not an eloquent speaker. God says, okay, Moses, I'll give you that one. (laughs) Your your, your brother Aaron is down there in Egypt, and he's an eloquent speaker. And you go and you tell him, and he can tell the people, and he can talk to Pharaoh. But bottom line, folks, what happened when Moses went down to Egypt? He didn't depend upon his brother. God empowered him to speak. And so here we have this fact, this truth. For 80 years, God was preparing Moses to do the commission, the task that he gave Moses to do. And when that uh, uh, confrontation took place between God and Moses, Moses started to complain and he started to resign. I can't do that. I'm ignorant. I'm nobody. Nobody will listen to me. I'm a poor speaker. And yet when Moses decided to do what God wanted him to do, God used him in a mighty way. Is that correct? How many times do we give reasons for not doing what God wants us to do? How many times are we like Moses and we say, oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just nobody. Nobody would listen to me. It was already said as we were singing, In Justin's prayer, praise God for he who is greater in us than he who is in the world. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But to let God do great things in your life and my life, we need to be willing to yield ourselves to him. After Moses gave all of the reasons why he couldn't do what God told him to do. Moses finally had a crisis of beliefs and decided to follow him. Folks, I am absolutely convinced that the Antelope Valley really doesn't know what God can do through a group of people who are willing to serve him and follow him unconditionally.
I believe that Sunrise Baptist Church can turn this valley upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you and you and you and you and you and you and me are willing to say, God, here I am. I surrender all to you. I give you all my excuses. I'm depending upon you. So you take me and you mold me and you form me and you use me for your glory. Folks, I'm absolutely convinced that this valley does not know what will happen if a group of people are willing to turn themselves over to the Lord. But the bottom line is that we need to be willing to do it. We see Moses as the lawgiver. We see him as the one who divided the Red Sea. We see him in his glorious days of his last 40 years of his life. But we also need to see the previous 80 years where God was preparing him and equipping him to do the work that he did in the last 40 years. God has equipped you and he has equipped me to do the work that he wants us to do. And we need to stop giving excuses for not doing it and just simply say to God, here I am. Take me and use me. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song of commitment. And if you need to say to God, God, here I am. I stand in your presence. Just simply lift that voice up to the Lord and ask him to empower you today. If you're here and you don't know Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord, if you don't have the assurance that God is present all around us all the time, if you don't have the assurance that God is with you and will be with you for all eternity, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Talk to me about receiving Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord. Deacons will be standing in the back, and if you want to talk to them, feel free to go and talk to them. But don't leave God's house today without making a decision to make Jesus Christ the Savior and the Lord of your life. Don't continue in your excuses. Turn to him, and he will save you and redeem you.